Part one, chapter seven of En Route by Jory Karl Heismans, translated by Charles Keegan Paul. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. But, but, thought Durtal, we must at any rate come to an understanding. The abbe wearies me with his quiet assumptions, his receptacle in which he must place me. He does not, I suppose, think of making me a seminarist or a monk. The seminary at my age is devoid of interest, and as to the convent, it is attractive from the mystical point of view, and even enticing from the artistic standpoint, but I have not the physical aptitudes, still less the spiritual predispositions to shut myself up forever in a cloister. But putting that aside, what does he mean? On the other hand, he has insisted on lending me the works of St. John of the Cross, and has made me read them. He has then an aim, for he is not a man to feel his way as he walks. He knows what he wishes and where he is going. Does he imagine that I am intended for the perfect life? And does he intend to put me on my guard by this course of reading against the disillusions which, according to him, beginners experience? His sense seems to fail him there. I have a very horror of bigotry and pious polish, but though I admire, I do not feel at all drawn towards the phenomena of mysticism. No, I am interested in seeing them in others. I like to see it all from my window, but will not go downstairs. I have no pretension to become a saint. All that I desire is to attain the intermediate state between goody-goodiness and sanctity. This is a frightfully low ideal, perhaps, but in practice it is the only one I am capable of attaining. And yet, then these questions have to be faced. If I am mistaken and am obeying false impulses, I am, as I advance, on the verge of madness. How, except by a special grace, am I to know whether I am in the right way or walking in the dark towards the abyss? Here, for instance, are those conversations between God and the soul so common in the mystical life. How can one be sure that this interior voice, these distinct words not heard with bodily ears, but perceived by the soul in a clearer fashion than if they came by the channels of sense, are true? How be sure that they emanate from God, not from our imagination, from the devil himself? I know indeed that Saint Teresa treats this matter at length in her Castles of the Soul, and that she points out the signs by which we can recognize the origin of the words, but her proofs do not seem to me always as easy to discern as she thinks. If these expressions come from God, she says, they are always accompanied by an effect, and bring with them an authority which nothing can resist. Thus a soul is in affliction, and the Lord simply suggests the words, Trouble not thyself and at once the whirlwind passes and joy revives. In the second place, these words leave an indissoluble peace of mind. They engrave themselves on the memory and often cannot be effaced. In the other case, she continues, if these words proceed from imagination or from the demon, none of these effects are produced. A kind of uneasiness, anguish and doubt torments you. Moreover, the expressions evaporate in part and fatigue the soul which endeavours in vain to recall them in their entirety. In spite of these tokens we are, in fact, standing on shifting ground in which we may sink at every step, but in his turn St. John of the Cross intervenes and tells you not to move. What then is to be done? No one, he says, ought to aspire to these supernatural communications and rest there for two motives. First, humility, the perfect abnegation of refusing to believe in them. The second, that in acting thus we deliver ourselves from the labour necessary to assure ourselves whether these vocal visions are true or false. And so we are dispensed from an examination which has no other profit for the soul than loss of time and anxiety. Good. But if these words are really pronounced by God, we rebel against his will if we remain deaf to them. And then, as Saint Teresa declares, it is not in our power not to listen to them, and the soul can only think of what it hears when Jesus speaks to it. Moreover, all the discussions on this subject are uncertain, for one does not enter of one's own will into the straight way, as the Church calls it. We are led, and even thrown into it, often against the will, and resistance is impossible, phenomena occur, and nothing in the world has power to check them. Witness Saint Teresa, who, resist as she would by humility, fell into ecstasy under the divine breath and was raised from the ground. No, these superhuman conditions alarm me, and I do not hold to knowing them by experience. As to Saint John of the Cross, the Abbé is not wrong in calling him unique, but though he sounds the lowest strata of the soul, and reaches where human augur has never penetrated. He wearies me all the same in my admiration, for his work is full of nightmares which repel me. I am not certain that his hell is correct, and some of his assertions do not convince me. 
What he calls the night obscure is incomprehensible. The sufferings of that darkness surpass what is possible, he cries on each page. Here I lose foothold. I can imagine, though I have not experienced them, the moral and terrible pangs of the deaths of friends and relations, love betrayed, hopes which failed, spiritual sorrows of all kinds. But such a martyrdom as he proclaims as superior to all others is beyond me, for it is outside our human interests, beyond our affections. He moves in an inaccessible sphere, in an unknown world very far off. I am certainly afraid that this terrible saint, a true man of the South, abuses metaphor and is full of Spanish affectation. Moreover, I am astonished at the Abbe on another point. He, who is so gentle, shows a certain leaning to the dry bread of mysticism. The effusions of Reisbrück, of St. Angela, of St. Catherine of Genoa, touch him less than the arguments of saints who are hard reasoners. Yet by the side of these he has advised me to read Marie d'Agreda, whom he ought not to fancy for she has none of those qualities which are admired in the works of St. Teresa and St. John of the Cross. Ah, he may flatter himself that he has inflicted on me a complete disillusion by lending me her Cite Mystique. From the renown of this Spanish woman I expected the breath of prophecy, wide outlooks, extraordinary visions. Not at all. Her book is simply strange and pompous, wearisome and cold. Then the phraseology of her book is intolerable. All the expressions which swarm in those ponderous volumes, my divine princess, my great queen, when she addresses Our Lady, who in her turn speaks to her as my dearest, just as Christ calls her my spouse, my well-beloved, and speaks of her continually as the object of my pleasure and delight. The way in which she speaks of the angels as the courtiers of the great king set my nerves on edge and weary me. They smell of periwigs and ruffles, bows and dances like Versailles a sort of court mysticism in which Christ pontificates, attired in the costume of Louis XIV. Moreover, Marie d'Agreda enters into the most extravagant details. She tells us of the milk of Our Lady which cannot grow sour, of female complaints from which she was exempt. She explains the mystery of the conception by three drops of blood which fell from the heart into the womb of Mary, and which the Holy Ghost used to form the child. Lastly, she declares that St. Michael and St. Gabriel played the part of midwives and stood living under human forms at the lying in of the Virgin. This is too strong. I know well that the Abbe would say that we need not concern ourselves with these singularities and these errors, but that the Cite Mystique is to be read in relation to the inner life of the Blessed Virgin. Yes, but then the book of Monsieur Ollier, which treats of the same subject, seems to me curious and trustworthy in quite a different way. Was the priest forcing the note, playing a part? Durtal asked himself this when he saw how determined he was not to avoid the same questions during a certain time. He tried now and then, in order to see how the matter was, to turn the conversation, but the abbé smiled and brought it back to the point he wished. When he thought that he had saturated Durtal with mystical works, he spoke of them less, and seemed to attach himself mainly to the religious orders, and especially to that of St. Benedict. He very cleverly induced Durtal to become interested in this institution and to ask him about it, and when once he had entered on this ground, he did not depart from it. It began one day when Durtal was talking with him about plain chant. You have reason to like it, said the abbé, for even independently of the liturgy and of art, this chant, if I may believe Saint Justin, appeases the desires and concupiscences of the flesh. Affectiones et concupiscentias carnis sedat. But let me assure you, you only know it by hearsay, there is no longer any true plain chant in the churches. These are like the products of therapeutics, only more or less audacious adulterations presented to you. None of the chants which are to some extent respected by choirs, the tantum ergo, for example, are now exact. It is given almost faithfully till the verse praestet fides, and then it runs off the rails, taking no account of the shades, which are, however, quite perceptible that the Gregorian melody introduces when the text declares the impotence of reason and the powerful aid of faith. These adulterations are still more apparent if you listen to the Salve Regina after Compline. This is abridged more than half, is enervated, blanched, half its pauses are taken away, it is reduced to a mere stump of ignoble music. If you had even heard this magnificent chant among the Trappists, you would weep with disgust at hearing it bawled in the churches at Paris. But besides the textual alteration of the melody as we now have it, the way in which the plain chant is bellowed is everywhere absurd. One of the first conditions for rendering it well is that the voices should go together, that they should all chant in the same time, syllable for syllable and note for note. In one word, it must be in unison. 
Now, you can verify it yourself. The Gregorian melody is not thus treated. Every voice takes its own part and is isolated. Next, plain music allows no accompaniment. It must be chanted alone, without organ. It bears at most that the instrument should give the intonation and accompany it very softly, just enough if need be to sustain the pitch taken by the voices. It is not so that you will hear it given in the churches. Yes, I know it well, said Durtal. When I hear it at Saint-Sulpice, Saint-Severin, or Notre-Dame-des-Victoires, I am aware that it is sophisticated, but you must admit that it is even then superb. I do not defend the tricks, the addition of fioritori, the falseness of the musical pauses, the felonious accompaniment, the concert room tone inflicted on you at Saint-Sulpice, but what can I do? In default of the original, I must be content with a more or less worthless copy. And I repeat, even executed in that fashion, the music is so admirable that I am enchanted by it. But, said the abbe quietly, nothing obliges you to listen to the false plain chant when you can hear the true, for saving your presence there exists, even in Paris, a chapel where it is intact, and given according to the rules of which I have spoken. Indeed, and where is that? At the Benedictine nuns of the Blessed Sacrament in the Rue Monsieur. And can anyone enter the convent and be present at the offices? Anyone. Every day in the week, vespers are sung at three o'clock, and on Sundays high mass is said at nine. Ah, oh, had I but known this chapel earlier, said Durtal the first time he came out. In fact, it combined all the conditions he could wish. Situated in a solitary street, it had the completest privacy. The architect who built it had introduced no innovations or pretentiousness, had built a Gothic church, and introduced no fancies of his own. It was cruciform, but one of the arms was scarcely the full length, for want of room, while the other was prolonged into a hall, separated from the choir by an iron grating above which the Blessed Sacrament was adored by two kneeling angels, whose lilac wings were folded over thin rose-coloured backs. Except these two figures, of which the execution was truly sinful, the rest was at least veiled by shadow, and was not too afflicting to the eyes. The chapel was dim, and always at the time of the officers a young sacristan sister, tall and pale, and rather bent, entered like a shadow, and each time that she passed before the altar, she fell on one knee and bowed her head profoundly. She seemed strange and scarcely human, gliding noiselessly over the pavement, her head bowed, with a band as low as her eyebrows, and she seemed to fly like a large bat when standing before the tabernacle she turned her back, moving her large black sleeves as she lighted the tapers. Durtal one day saw her features, sickly but charming, her eyelids dark, her eyes of a tired blue, and he guessed that her body was wasted by prayers, under her black robe drawn together by a leathern girdle ornamented by a little medal of the Blessed Sacrament of gilt metal under the trimming near her heart. The grating of the enclosure on the left of the altar was large and well lighted from behind, so that even when the curtains were drawn it was possible to see the whole chapter drawn up in file in their oaken stalls surmounted at the end by a higher stall in which the abbess sat. A lighted taper stood in the middle of the hall, and before it a nun prayed day and night, a cord round her neck, to expiate the insults offered to Jesus under his Eucharistic form. The first time Durtal had visited the chapel, he had gone there on a Sunday, a little before the time of Mass, and he had thus been able to be present at the entry of the Benedictine nuns behind the iron screen. They advanced two and two, stopped in the middle of the grating, turned to the altar and genuflected, then each bowed to her neighbour, and so to the end of this procession of women in black, only brightened by the whiteness of the headband and the collar, and the gilt spot of the little monstrance on the breast. The novices came last, to be recognised by the white veils which covered their heads. And when an old priest, assisted by a sacristan, began the mass softly at the end of the chapter, a small organ gave the tone to the voices. Then Durtal might well wonder, for he had never before heard a soul and only voice made up of perhaps some thirty, of a tone so strange, a super-terrestrial voice, which burnt upon itself, in the air, and intertwined its soft cooings. This bore no resemblance to the icy and obstinate lament of the Carmelites, nor was it like the unsexed tone, the child's voice, squeaking, rounded off at the end of the Franciscan nuns, but quite another thing. At La Glacière, in fact, those raw voices, though softened and watered by prayers, kept somewhat of the drawling, almost vulgar inflection of the people from whom they came. They were greatly purified, but remained nonetheless human. Here the tenderness of tones was rendered angelic, that voice with no defined origin long bolted through the divine sieve, 
patiently modelled for the liturgical chant, caught fire as it unfolded, blazed in virginal clusters of white sound, died down, flowered out again in pale pleadings, distant, seraphic at the end of certain chants. Thus interpreted, the Mass gave a special accent to the sense of the sequences. Standing behind the grating, the convent answered the priest. Durtal had then heard, after a mournful and solemn Kyrie eleison, sharp and almost tragic, the decided cry, so loving and so grave, of the Gloria in Excelsis, to the true plain chant. He had listened to the credo, slow and bare, solemn and pensive, and he was able to affirm that these chants were totally different from those which were sung everywhere in the churches. Saint-Severin and Saint-Sulpice now seemed to him profane. In the place of their gentle warmth, their curls and their fringes, the angles of their polished melodies, their modern endings, their incoherent accompaniments arranged for the organ, he found himself in the presence of a chant, thin, sharp and nervous, like the work of an early master, and saw the ascetic severity of its lines, its sonorous colouring, the brightness of its metal hammered out with the rude yet charming art of Gothic jewels. He heard under the woven robe of sound the beating of a simple heart, the ingenuous love of ages, and he noticed that curious shade in Benedictine music. It ended all cries of adoration, all tender cooings in a timid murmur, cut short as though shrinking in humility, effacing itself modestly as though asking pardon of God for daring to love him. Ah, you were very right to send me there, said Durtal to the abbe when next he saw him. I had no choice, answered the priest, smiling, for the plain chant is respected only in convents under the Benedictine rule. That grand order has restored it. Don Potier has done for it what Don Guéranger has done for the liturgy. Moreover, beyond the authenticity of the vocal text, and the manner of rendering it, there are still two essential conditions for restoring the special life of these melodies, and they are hardly found except in cloisters, first faith, and next the understanding the meaning of the words sung. But, interrupted Durtal, I do not suppose that the Benedictine nuns know Latin. I beg your pardon. Among the nuns of St. Benedict, and even among the cloistered sisters of other orders, there are a certain number who study the language enough to understand the breviary and the psalms. That is a serious advantage which they have over the choirs, composed for the most part of artisans without instruction and without piety, only simple workers with their voices. Now, without wishing to abate your enthusiasm for the musical honesty of these nuns, I am bound to say that in order to understand this magnificent chant in its height and breadth, you must hear it, not winnowed by the mouths of virgins, even if unsexed, but as it issues, unsmoothed, untrimmed from the lips of men. Unfortunately, though there are at Paris, in the Rue Monsieur and the Rue Tournefort, two communities of Benedictine nuns, there is not, on the other hand, a single monastery of Benedictine monks. At the Rue Monsieur, do they absolutely follow the rule of Saint Benedict? Yes. But over and above the usual vows of poverty, chastity, remaining in the cloister, obedience, they make a further vow of separation and adoration of the Blessed Sacrament, as formulated by Saint MacTilde. And so they lead the most austere existence of any nuns. They scarcely taste flesh. They rise at two in the morning to sing matins and lauds. Night and day, summer and winter, they take turns before the taper of reparation and before the altar. It need not be said, continued the abbe after a pause, that woman is stronger and braver than man. No male ascetic could live and lead such a life, especially in the enervating atmosphere of Paris. What perhaps astounds me still more, said Durtal, is the kind of obedience exacted of them. How can a creature endowed with free will annihilate herself to such an extent? Oh, said the abbé, the obedience is the same in all the great orders, absolute, without reserve. Its formula is well summed up by St. Augustine. Listen to this sentence which I remember to have read in a commentary on his rule. We must enter into the feelings of a beast of burthen, and allow ourselves to be led like a horse or a mule, which have no understanding, or rather that obedience may be still more perfect, since these animals kick against the spur, we must be in the hands of a superior like a block, or the stock of a tree, which has neither life, nor movement, nor action, nor will, nor judgment. Is that clear? It is most frightful. I quite admit, said Durtal, that in exchange for such abnegation, the nuns must be powerfully aided from on high. But are there not some moments of falling away, some cases of despair, some instance in which they pine for a natural life in the open air, 
in which they lament that death in life which they have made for themselves? Are there not days in which their senses wake and cry aloud? No doubt. In the cloistered life the age of twenty-nine is terrible to pass, then a passionate crisis arises. If a woman doubles that cape, and she almost always does so, she is safe. But carnal emotions are not, to speak correctly, the most troublesome assault they have to undergo. The real punishment they endure in those hours of sorrow is the ardent, wild regret for that maternity of which they are ignorant. The desolate womb of woman revolts, and full of God though she be, her heart is breaking. The child Jesus whom they have loved so well then appears so far off and so inaccessible, and his very sight would hardly satisfy them, for they have dreamed of holding him in their arms, of swathing and rocking him, of giving him suck, in one word, of being mothers. Other nuns undergo no precise attack, no assault to which a name could be given, but without any definite reason they languish and die suddenly, like a taper blown out. The torpor of the cloister kills them. But indeed, Monsieur l'Abbé, these details are far from encouraging. The priest shrugged his shoulders. It is the poor reverse of a splendid stuff, he said. Wonderful recompenses are granted, even in this world, to souls in convents. Nor do I suppose that if a nun falls, stricken in the flesh, she is abandoned. What does the mother abess in such a case? She acts according to the bodily temperament and state of the soul of the sick person. Note that she has been able to follow her during the years of her probation, that she has necessarily gained an influence over her. At such times, therefore, she will watch her daughter very closely, endeavour to turn the course of her ideas, breaking her by hard work and by occupying her mind. She must not leave her alone, must diminish her prayers if need be, restrict her hours of office, lessen her fasts, give her, if the case demands it, better food. In other cases, on the contrary, she will have recourse to more frequent communions, lessen her food or cause her to be blooded, mix cooling meats with her diet, and above all things she and all the community must pray for her. An old Benedictine abbess whom I knew at Saint-Omer, an incomparable guide of souls, limited before all things the length of confessions. The moment she saw the least symptoms arise, she gave two minutes, watch in hand, to the penitent, and when the time was up, she sent her back from the confessional to mix with her companions. Why so? Because in convents, even for souls which are well, confession is a most dangerous relaxation. It is, as it were, too long and too warm a bath. In it nuns go to excess, open their hearts uselessly, dwell upon their troubles, accentuate them and revel in them. They come out more weakened and more ill than before. Two minutes ought indeed be enough for a nun in which to tell her little sins. Yet, yet, I must admit it, the confessor is a danger for a convent. Not that I suspect his honour. That is not at all what I mean. But as he is generally chosen from among the bishop's favourites, there are many chances that he may be a man who knows nothing, and quite ignorant of how to deal with such souls, ends by unsettling them while he consoles them. Again, if demoniac attacks, so common in nunneries, occur, the poor man can only gape, gives all sorts of confused counsel, and hinders the energy of the abbess, who in such matters knows far better than he. And, said Durtal, who chose his words carefully, tell me, I suppose that tales like those which Diderot gives in his foolish volume La Religieuse are incorrect? Unless a community is rotted by a superior given over to Satanism, which, thank God, is rare, the filthy stories told by that writer are false, and there is moreover a good reason why it should be so, for there is a sin which is the very antidote of the other, the sin of zeal. What? Yes, the sin of zeal which causes the denunciation of our neighbour, gives scope to jealousy, creates spying to satisfy hate, that is the real sin of the cloister. Well, I assure you that if two sisters became quite shameless, they would be denounced at once. But I thought, Monsieur l'Abbé, that tail-bearing was allowed by the rules of most orders. It is, but perhaps there is a temptation to carry it somewhat to excess, especially in convents of women. For you can imagine that if nunneries contain pure mystics, real saints, they have in them also some nuns less advanced in the way of perfection, and who even still retain some faults. Come, since we are in the chapter of minute details, dare I ask if cleanliness is not just a little neglected by these good women? I cannot say. All that I know is that in the Benedictine abbeys I have known, each nun was free to act as seemed good to her. 
In certain Augustinian constitutions, the case was provided for in contrary fashion. It was forbidden to wash the body, except once a month. On the other hand, amongst the Carmelites, cleanliness is exacted. St. Teresa hated dirt and loved white linen. Her daughters have even, I think, a right to have a flask of eau de cologne in their cells. You see, this depends on the order, and probably also, when the rule does not expressly mention it, on the ideas which the superior may have on the subject. I will add that this question must not be looked at only from the worldly point of view, for corporal dirt is for certain souls an additional suffering and mortification which they impose on themselves, as Benedict Labre. He who picked up vermin which left him and put them piously in his sleeve, I prefer mortifications of another kind. There are harder ones, believe me, and I think they would suit you better. Would you like to imitate Suso, who, to subdue his passions, bore on his naked shoulders for eighteen years an enormous cross set with nails, whose points pierced his flesh? More than that, he imprisoned his hands in leather gloves, which also bristled with nails, lest he should be tempted to dress his wounds. St. Rose of Lima treated herself no better. She bound a chain so tightly round her body that it penetrated the skin, and hid itself under the bleeding pad of flesh, she wore also a horsehair girdle set with pins and lay on shards of glass. But all these trials are nothing in comparison of those inflicted on herself by a Capuchin nun, the venerable Mother Paside of Siena. She scourged herself with branches of juniper and holly, then poured vinegar into her wounds and sprinkled them with salt. She slept in winter on the snow, in summer on bunches of nettles or pebbles or brushes, put drops of hot lead in her shoes, knelt upon thistles, thorns and sticks. In January she broke the ice in a cask and plunged into it, and she even half stifled herself by hanging head downwards in a chimney in which damp straw was lighted. But that is enough. Indeed, said the abbe laughing, if you had to choose, you would like best the mortifications which Benedict Labre imposed on himself. I would rather have none at all, answered Durtal. There was a moment's pause. Durtal's thoughts went back to the Benedictine nuns. But, said he, why do they put in the semaine religieuse, after their title Benedictine nuns of the Blessed Sacrament, this further name, Convent of Saint Louis du Temple? Because, said the abbé, their first convent was founded on the actual ruins of the temple prison, given them by royal warrant when Louis XVIII returned to France. Their foundress and superior was Louise Adelaide de bourbon condy an unfortunate princess of many wanderings, almost the whole of whose life was spent in exile. Expelled from France by the Revolution and the Empire, hunted in almost every country in Europe, she wandered by chance among convents seeking shelter, now among the nuns of the Annunciation at Turin and the Capuchins in Piedmont, now among the Trappistines in Switzerland and the Sisters of the Visitation at Vienna, now among the Benedictines of Lithuania and Poland. At last she found shelter among the Benedictines in Norfolk, Till she could again enter France. She was a woman singularly trained in monastic science and experienced in the direction of souls. She desired that in her abbey every sister should offer herself to heaven in reparation for crimes committed, and that she should accept the most painful privations to make up for those which might be committed. She instituted there the perpetual adoration, and introduced the plain chant, in all its purity, to the exclusion of all others. It is, as you have been able to hear, there preserved intact. It is true that since her time her nuns have had lessons from Dom Schmidt, one of the most learned monks in that matter. Then, after the death of the princess, which took place, I think, in 1824, it was perceived that her body exhaled the odour of sanctity, and though she has not been canonised, her intercession is invoked by her daughters in certain cases. Thus, for example, the Benedictine nuns of the Rue Monsieur ask her assistance when they lose anything and their experience shows that their prayer is never in vain, since the object lost is found almost at once. But, continued the abbé, since you like the convent so well, go there, especially when it is lighted up. The priest rose and took up a semaine religieuse which lay upon the table. He turned over the leaves. See, he said, and read, Sunday three o'clock, Vespers chanted, ceremony of clothing, presided over by the very reverend Father Don Etienne, abbot of the Grande Trappe, and benediction. That is a ceremony which interests me much. I too shall probably be there. Then we can meet in the chapel? Just so. 
These ceremonies of clothing have not now the gaiety they had in the 18th century in certain Benedictine institutions. Amongst others, the Abbey de Bourbourg in Flanders, said the abbe, smiling after a silence. And since Durtal looked at him questioningly, yes, there was no sadness about it, or at least it had a special sadness of its own. You shall judge. On the eve of the day that the postulant was to take the habit, she was presented to the abbess of Bourbourg by the governor of the town. Bread and wine were offered to her, and she tasted them in the church itself. On the morrow she appeared, magnificently dressed, at a ball which was attended by the whole community of nuns, where she danced, then she asked her parents' blessing, and was conducted, with violins playing, to the chapel, where the abbess took possession of her. She had for the last time seen, at the ball, the joys of the world, for she was immediately shut up for the rest of her days in the cloister. The joy of the dance of death, said Durtal, Monastic customs and congregations were strange in old days. No doubt, but they are lost in the night of time. I remember, however, that in the 15th century there existed under the rule of St. Augustine an order strange indeed, called the Order of the Daughters of St. Maluire, whose convent was in the Rue Saint-Denis at Paris. The conditions of admission were the reverse of those of all other charters. The postulant had to swear on the Holy Gospels that she had been unchaste, and no one believed her oath. She was examined, and if her oath were false, she was declared unworthy to be received. Nor might she have brought about this condition expressly in order to enter the convent. She must have well and truly given herself over to sin before she came to ask the shelter of the cloister. They were, in fact, a troop of penitent girls, and the rule of their subjection was savage. They were whipped, locked up, subjected to the most rigid fasts, made their confessions thrice in the week, rose at midnight, were under the most unremitting surveillance, were even attended in their most secret retirement. Their mortifications were incessant and their closure absolute. I need hardly add that this nunnery is dead. Nor likely to revive, cried Durtal. Well then, Monsieur l'abbé, we meet on Sunday in the Rue Monsieur. And on the ascent of the abbé, Durtal went his way, with the strangest ideas in his head about the monastic orders thing would be, he thought, to found an abbey where one could work at ease in a good library. There should be several monks, with decent meals, plenty of tobacco, and permission to take a turn on the keys now and then. And he laughed. But then that would not be a monastery, or only a Dominican monastery, with monks who dine out and have at least the amusement of preaching. End of part one, chapter seven. <laughs>